G'day everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max and I'm joined by Flynn as always. We've got some pretty cool topics to go through today. Namely, uh, Western Sydney University, which is a fairly big university in Western Sydney if you couldn't guess, had a data breach and a pretty big one at that as well as there seems to be a bit of an issue going around in the academic world where quantity is being focused over quality. So we'll get right into it. But Flynn, do you want to talk about this Western Sydney Uni attack? Yeah, so the act- our knowledge that an attack actually did happen, it's not really news. So this is came out in around May, I believe. The Western Sydney made a statement around this. But basically more information has come out about the severity of the breach, which seems to be, uh, we're a bit of a broken record at this point that, you know, we're saying a breach happens and then we're realizing how bad it is. But more information has come out. Um, supposedly 580 terabytes of data of for over eight months um, was extracted from their storage system um, with a lot of that, including different PII data. What was also interesting is the nature of how they did it. So basically, right at the mill of, you know, hacker gets into a certain place and then they um, they sort of use privileged access. They go to one system to another and they move laterally, which is, if for any of our viewers that haven't seen, looked into, I suppose, the processes of a hacker, it's a really sort of interesting thing to do with how they do it. I suppose it's the mindset of a hacker, which is what we were sort of taught in uni, I suppose, of, you know, seeing not necessarily getting blocked by a certain path. So I think, Max, you um, said they got into a really particular lab within the uni and then moved from one network to another and eventually, you know, got into one of their storage systems. Yeah, so what it looks like is being suggested here is that they are running a a bit of an interesting project called the Universities or Western Sydney Universities Solar Car Laboratory Infrastructure. So I'm guessing they're trying to build some kind of product or, you know, test some kind of um, system that has a solar-powered car. And I I guess that solar-powered car is connected to the internet and um, probably had a bit of a weak endpoint there. Now, what's happened then, this is then shared in relation to how they lost actually um, up to 7,500 people's uh, email addresses and other work documents so this happened in about january this year uh western sydney uni said that they've um been targeted an attack on their microsoft 365 data um which was because of the solar car and then now it's being said that the data that was taken from them in that microsoft 365 um breach that uh, they've now lost access to um, yeah their 580 terabytes of data. Just to put that in perspective a little bit, one file on your computer is going to go through around uh, up to up to and around about like three to five megabytes. Now that would mean that uh, you would need say it's about five five megabytes or so. You need uh, about 200 of those to be able to get to one gigabyte which is a thousand megabytes so 200 files for one gigabyte and um then a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes so 200 times a thousand times 580 (laughs) so um yeah that that, that's that's just crazy it's an absolutely insane amount of data they've lost the network they seem to have gotten into is called isalon and Isilon is apparently a network attached storage system, which to me just sounds like a cloud storage solution. Like, yeah, it's basically Dell's storage solution. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, right in the middle. I'd, if nobody has done it before, I'd recommend looking into different cool stories about privilege escalation. Sometimes you're pretty shocked with how different people um, get into different spots. Like, who would have thought that the, I suppose, the solar car lab would be the downfall of your whole infrastructure yeah (laughs) um but but a big problem with a lot of australian entities particularly is that you know they have all these fancy tools stopping you from getting in on the outside yeah and then once you are have managed to get in there's it's basically like a soft shell inside there's there's an actual term around it um 
but it's it's like application hardening. There's like you, once you get into a system, it's so easy to compromise it from there, which has clearly been the case. Well, we don't know how difficult it was, but um, you know, ideally, you would have that the solar car one being completely isolated from the rest of um, the the network. Yeah. So so it's it's a bit of a weird one. You usually, if you've been subject to some kind of lateral movement attack. It's a bit tricky to do it um, because it means that they found stuff in your data that has allowed them to progress in other areas of your infrastructure. Now, the annoying bit here is that they did it once. They used the solar car to get information on the M365. So some somewhere in that product, someone lost access to the M365. You think the uni would take this serious enough to then go, okay, we need to make sure that there's the right conditional access in place to make sure that any unauthorized access is found very, very quickly and reacted to it from there. So um, just another thing as well, I've just done the maths on my end. So if you're considering an average file size of five megabytes, which even then is very big for a file, usually there are a lot less than that, um, they would have lost a minimum of 116 million files uh, from this data breach. So yeah, that's although I... I assume that something something's got to be in there, like video files or something like that, that are bigger in storage. But it still does show the extent of you know what was lost here. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, five hundred eighty terabytes is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And so they've said that eighty three out of the four hundred directories in their uh, Acilian storage were accessed. Which, if you've had any experience with computers and directories you'll know that some directories have a lot of information and some not so much so from how much data was taken i'd assume they got into some pretty important directories there yeah and you know it it just kind of comes back to what we say which is you need to make sure that you're aware of the data that you're storing and um and if you've lost pii there needs to be further measures that are that are in place and you know the uni has known about this for about this for a very long time now. So, um, yeah. And the annoying bit here is that the uni kept saying that there's no evidence that the the data was being used anywhere or published anywhere. And it's like, well, that doesn't help you out. It doesn't matter. It yeah. Doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. That just means that the attackers decided to wait before they've either published it or made their next move. So saying, oh, we've lost our data, but it's you know it's not on the internet, is about as useful as saying, well, we've you know, I've unlocked my front door and someone's broken into my house, but at least they haven't stolen anything yet. Yeah, but they're waiting in my cupboard. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I'm hiding in my my room and I hear them rummaging around, but I'm pretty sure they haven't stolen anything as of yet. Yeah, it's it's a strategy I've seen companies use before and it's really just, I'm pretty sure Medibank or someone did a similar thing where it's very... It's such a cop out thing. It it means nothing. Um, once the data is out of the system, you it's safe to assume that, you know, anything can happen from that point. Someone can use it maliciously. There's no point in saying, oh, you know, and there's no way that you could tell where it's gone. Um, you know, a maybe your forensics team looking at, you know, where it's gone, or people looking at the dark web to see if it's being sold could just be doing a bad job, and also yeah. the attackers could just be selling it. You know. Not like, like in, in their own network, right? Yeah. yeah. Or using it uh, internally, you know, it could be a state actor. Who knows what's going on here? Um, but saying, having, making statements like that is is just stupid. It doesn't help anyone. Um, the only people I'd say it does help is gives a false sense of security to people who don't know any better. Or um, lost their data as a result of the breach. Yep. Um, and I suppose another frustrating thing is, you know, with universities, you know, they teach cybersecurity courses. It was one of the places I was considering to go study, and it's just like, oh, um, I suppose it's inevitable. I'm, ass- I'm assuming they're all going to get done at some point, but um, yeah. yeah, it makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like saying, you know, someone's broken into my house, stolen all my expensive watches, but I'm checking, I'm refreshing my phone, and it's not on eBay just yet, so I think it's okay. And yeah. <laughs> I think they might just forget about it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But on um, universities, I've been reading a couple articles recently and talking to some people about um, basically a growing problem in the academics field. 
um, which is a bit of close to the to my heart, I suppose, because I did work um, uh, adjacent with the university at one point doing research. And it's that a lot of professors or universities or colleges, they take an approach of we will just submit as many academic papers as possible rather than producing actual quality papers at the time, which isn't even a security issue. It's a global issue for research in general. Um, but the reason why I'm bringing this up is that I don't think this is going to go anywhere. I think it's going to get worse considering basically a lot of how a lot of universities get their grants is by them producing papers. It's like they have to meet a certain amount of papers being produced, mm. um, which is basically why they do it. Um, and so there's a massive incentive for them to do this. And this is only going to get worse because with AI getting so much better, I'm pretty sure there was a massive spike in how many papers were being, being produced at some point. Um, I was reading about one guy who publishes a paper every two days, which um, I'll let you do the maths, Max. Um, you're, you're being the maths teacher for this lesson. The, there's no way that you could be writing that much um, quality research or that much in general and producing a paper every two days. There's just no way. It's going to be assisted... Um, I suppose maybe he has a huge team behind him, but it's the most likely thing is that it's poor quality research that's just being churned out um, and most likely having AI-assisted tools. Yeah, 100%. Like, that's like 102, 182.5 papers a year. So, yeah, you know, you can't assume that if you're writing 100-plus papers a year that they're going to be any good, man. They're going to be just rubbish. Um, yeah. And, you know, it kind of builds into the kind of agenda of the internet becoming while while it is you know such a good of uh area for the sharing of information it may not be a good area for the sharing of valuable information and what we want to not happen is just to fill up the internet and academic resources to do with you know important areas of study we don't want to just fill it up with shit and we don't want to fill it up with rubbish and trash that isn't actually worthwhile being there because at that point what you do is you just clutter everything and you make it so if people are trying to genuinely excel or you know try and learn more about a th certain thing you're making it more difficult for them to learn and you're making it more difficult for anyone to to you know get a better more uh refined education in in certain areas or a refined research mentality it, that's, yeah. that's that's generally my opinion there. It's just that's not factual and not backed up by anything, but that's my opinion that, um, yeah, filling up academic uh, areas with just shit is 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 not good. It's just going to result in, um, in, you know, less quality. And if anyone's seen that movie about that guy who gets sent forward like a thousand years in the future and everyone's really dumb and he's just like average but is really smart, you know, it makes me think that we're just going to get there if we just, you know, don't focus on quality uh, papers. Yeah. I mean, what we learn from going to uni is that, oh, you know, don't use your sources like Wikipedia and such. Use peer review journals um, and stuff like that. Well, what happens if, you know, those start becoming terrible quality as well? It's just, um, you know, deep finding, you know, trustworthy resources is going to be more difficult. And I feel like these days Wikipedia isn't that bad. Like the issue that's true is is um, Wikipedia pages that are new or a very, very, very niche. Ones that are popular are fine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> fine from a getting your information from, probably not from an academic sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. From, probably, yeah, you don't want to be using those for university, but like high school and stuff, they would still say, don't use Wikipedia, but... You know, I'd find some random website from 2008 from some dude just typing random shit. I don't know if that would be much better. Ah, the movie's called Idiocracy, if anyone wants to have a look at it. You know, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration on my part, but um, it's it's just a, a funny example of, you know, how we don't want society to end up being more, more and more reliant on AI and less informed and less intelligent in general. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.